All right, let's turn now to India's neighborhood. And it's an interesting trend that we have seen for the past few years that the land focus, Pakistan, China, in other words, has started to get diluted and India has started to look a little further afield and especially looking to rekindle some of the ancient trading routes, the ocean routes. And that's why countries like the UAE become important. The Middle East becomes important. Countries in Africa put important. And yes, Maldives, Seychelles, that's the reason why Maldives have been so much on the headlines. Countries like that also become important. So at this time, it's been a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to some of those neighbors. Maldives, obviously, it's been a challenging period. We've just seen after those remarks that were made about Prime Minister Modi, we've just seen these pictures of uh, the, the Maldivian president going to China and 20 agreements were signed and all sorts of statements were made uh, him inviting more and more Chinese presence. So that's that's the bad news when it comes to Bangladesh elections held. Sheikh Hasina is back. New Delhi will see that as good news and a signal of continuity. And then, of course, the continuing engagement with West Asia, with the Middle East, with the UAE and Saudi Arabia continues. Well, let's just get three top experts into this discussion now. People who've been the ambassador to the UAE and the High Commissioners to the Maldives and, the, and, and Bangladesh, uh, Nadeep Suri, Daneshwar Mule, and Veena Sikri, all three joining us right now. Um, Mr. Suri, Ambassador Suri, can I just start with you? You know, before I come to the details of what's happening in Bangladesh or Maldives, you, of course, have a very clear view of what's been happening in the UAE. You yourself have driven a lot of the changes when it comes to India's relationships with the UAE. The point I was just making that the neighborhood used to be Pakistan in most people's minds, China perhaps. Now, very correctly, India is realizing that the neighborhood has to go much further. And those ancient ocean routes, which also connect to places like the UAE, become all the more important. Could that be a correct way of framing it? Yeah, Vikram. Uh, my sense is that we are actually rediscovering the uh, neighborhood rather than discovering it. Um, yeah. We were always a seafaring nation. Um, uh, through the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, the ingress into India, whether it was the Portuguese, the French, or the British, came via the sea. Uh, and, and when we look at the spread of Indian uh, civilization and culture into Southeast Asia, uh, and the historic trade links between Gujarat and the Malabar coast uh, with the Gulf and beyond with East Africa, it was all seafaring, right? But I think somewhere perhaps the trauma of the partition uh, and the uh, situation created with Pakistan got us to focus excessively on our land borders. And perhaps for the first 30, 40 years, we took our eyes off the ball in terms of our near neighborhood, uh, which is uh, of uh, both uh, commercial and strategic interest from our perspective. So I'm delighted that after having started the Look East policy in the 1990s uh, with our outreach to the ASEAN uh, countries, we've now started doing this Look West policy of uh, um, uh, restoring and reclaiming our uh, traditional ties uh, with the West Asia and particularly with the Gulf. I think there's one additional point here, Vikram. Um, I think somewhere uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, and perhaps even earlier, we ceded some of our influence in this region to Pakistan, which was able to play the Ummah card, that this was part of the larger Islamic fraternity uh, that Pakistan could lay us some kind of a natural claim to. Uh, and, 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 and given what has happened in India in terms of our growth, given the changes that are taking place in countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia, which are now distancing themselves from some of the more conservative aspects of Islam and really basing their foreign policy not uh, on any religious premise, but on uh, pragmatic considerations. I think all of this is, that has coalesced uh, into this uh, 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 rediscovery and reinvigoration of our ties with the, with the Gulf. Before I move back to the UAE, I just wanted to get your sense of all that has been happening in the Maldives, you know, the comments that have been made by some and of course they were suspended later but comments made by junior ministers and that boycott Maldives campaign um, now you know he's he's there in China making again not very friendly remarks what's your sense of what's happening there I think um, it's a situation for us to show maturity and patience um, I don't think uh, we need to be led by uh, some of the aggressive commentary that we are seeing on um, on uh, social media 
Um, we should be guided by our long-term considerations. Maldives isn't going to go anywhere. It's going to stay uh, uh, as our neighbor. Uh, and our interests in Maldives are permanent. They are not uh, ephemeral. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, we have to uh, get re used to the idea that there will be uh, times when the government there is not as favorable to us as another one. And we have to live with that. We have to make the best that we can do uh, with that government uh, and, and, and hopefully be persuasive that their interests are also aligned with a better relationship with India. So let me turn to the UAE, which of course is a country that you have been uh, ambassador in, increasingly seems to be becoming a very important strategic partner and a strategic ally for India, the doorway for West Asia, for the Middle East. Um, and for them also, it's uh, it seems that India has become increasingly important. Look at the symbolism of what's happening. Seven uh, meetings, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed has is, is, is gone for vibrant Gujarat, and now a temple is going to come up right here in, in Abu Dhabi. A lot seems to be happening. Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, I had the privilege of uh, not only having a ringside view to the transformation that has happened in our, our relations with UAE, but also playing a bit of a role in that. And, and uh, you know, in foreign policy, we normally think that uh, changes in relationships are incremental. Uh, and, and But the kind of dramatic transformation that we've seen with UAE over the last decade, I think at one level, a lot of Credit goes to the in, in the energy that Prime Minister Modi has personally invested into this relationship. A lot of people don't realize that he has visited UAE seven times uh, over the last uh, nine and a half years or so. Uh, and this is a country where no Indian Prime Minister had visited from Mrs. Gandhi in 1981 until Prime Minister Modi went in 2015. Um, uh, and, and for... Um, the president of UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, to be in Gujarat for Vibrant Gujarat and the kind of roadshow and the Ahlan uh, Modi uh, events that are being planned. Prime Minister Modi is going to be back in Abu Dhabi uh, in, in, uh, in a month's time for the inauguration of the first Hindu temple in uh, UAE. You know, I had to spend a lot of time uh, persuading my interlocutors, particularly in India, uh, who don't know how large the relationship is. Uh, with UAE. 3.5 million Indians uh, is 35% of UAE's population. It's the largest concentration of Indian nationals outside India. Let that sink in. It's the largest source of remittances for India, close to $20 billion a year that supports economies in several states in India, right? Uh, particularly in Kerala and so on. Uh, it is our third largest trading partner after the US and China. A lot of people don't realize that it's larger trading partner than Japan or Germany or UK or France. It's counterintuitive. But our exports, uh, our trade last year was $80 billion. It's our second largest destination of exports uh, after the United States. Uh, and, and that's partly because of the efficiency of Dubai and or Jabal Ali as, uh, as an anthropo from where Goods can be transshipped to East Africa, to Central Asia, to Iran, even in some cases to Pakistan. Um, uh, all of that happens through, uh, through Dubai. And increasingly, uh, the two elements that were perhaps not existing earlier, one is the very proactive approach of UAE's large sovereign funds to invest into Indian infrastructure. And we see those billions of dollars flowing into telecom, into ports, into renewable energy, into highways, all of those sectors that are critical to us. And this is patient capital, uh, which is going to really contribute to uh, uh, India's uh, e economic uh, growth. Uh, and the last point that Vikram I'll make, which is again transformational, is the kind of political support that UAE has been extending to us at crucial junctures. I mean, I was in, in, in Abu Dhabi when Article 370 was revoked. And, 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 and it mattered to us politically that UAE became the first Arab country to say this is India's internal business. So would you say that for whatever is happening, the overtures that are being made, it also signals some sort of a transformation that is taking place in the Middle East, in countries like Saudi Arabia and certainly here in UAE? I mean... The fact that one of the largest Hindu temples anywhere is coming up in Abu Dhabi, it signals a certain opening up, a certain multiculturalism that India is, is, is clearly taking note of also. These countries are also changing. 
there's no question about that. We can trace, I think, the transition that has happened in these countries, particularly in UAE. I've seen it firsthand. Um, I think it started around 9-11 when there was a shock that you could actually have Saudis and Emiratis who come from a very prosperous background participating in the World Trade Center attacks. We saw it after the so-called Arab Spring, uh, the risks of uh, a slide towards Islamic fundamentalism. And, and now uh, in UAE uh, in particular, uh, I think they not only have uh, created this very high level post of a minister for tolerance and it, the Sheikh Nahyan bin Mubarak al Nahyan, who's the minister, is from the royal family himself uh, to, to really drive the agenda uh, of interfaith harmony, to demonstrate that you can be from any uh, faith and be safe. And, 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 you know, we've seen that not just towards the Hindu community in the form of the temple and the increasing civil liberties that people can enjoy in their personal lives. Uh, we are seeing that in terms of the normalization that was happening with Israel, uh, that you could have get kosher food in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, and, and a conscious effort to remove anti-Semitic references from textbooks and, and, and so on. So you can see it's part of a plan. Uh, the Emiratis did something really interesting about uh, five years back when they had invited both the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar and the Pope to create this document of human fraternity. They've created this remarkable complex in Abu Dhabi called House of Abraham's Family, where you've got a mosque, a synagogue, and a church within the same compound, uh, and all three of the same size symbolically, uh, to send the message of equivalence between the uh, faiths. And I think in all of this transformation that is happening, India, which is seen as multicultural, uh, stands out uh, as a natural partner. Um, some of this influence that you emanated from UAE also traveled to Saudi Arabia, and you can see the dramatic changes that Sheikh Mohammed bin Salman is trying to bring out within Saudi Arabia. And I believe that these have profound implications, not just for these countries, but about perceptions of Islam across the world, and particularly what's happening in Saudi Arabia, because for several decades, Saudi Arabia was the fountainhead of all the most reactionary Wahhabi ideologies. And you could see them uh, take hold in Pakistan and Afghanistan and parts of India and elsewhere. Today, if Saudi Arabia starts becoming a more normal country in the way it approaches matters of religion, matters of faith, then Hopefully, that too is going to radiate. And in our neighborhood, you see the impact, for example, uh, with regard to uh, Taliban. Uh, Taliban 1.0 were amongst the Saudis, were amongst the first to recognize them. Taliban 2.0 is still craving Saudi recognition and hasn't received it. So let's now do a roundup of some of the neighbors. What actually is happening in the Maldives right now is causing a lot of concern. What's happening in Bangladesh after the elections? A lot less concern, perhaps some some joy and some happiness uh, in, in New Delhi. And of course, then the UAE, which is a special focus. Naturally, I'm, I mean, I'm here in Dubai, so it's going to be one of our special focuses here. But let's start by turning our attention to the Maldives and to Bangladesh. And it's a great pleasure to have with us Mr. Nanishwar Mule, who was a, a high commissioner to the Maldives at a very critical period, actually, 2009, 2012, 13, that particular era. He was the high commissioner to the Maldives. We also privileged to have with us uh, High Commissioner Veena Sikri, who was the High Commissioner in, in Bangladesh uh, as well. So both those very important countries, uh, we have the right people to tell us all about that. Um, Mr. Mr. Muller, why don't I start with you? Because so much talk about the Maldives, right? And this there seems to be a flip-flop. And you actually saw the first of the flip-flops in a pro-India government suddenly was replaced by a pro-China regime around about 2011, more of a coup actually than anything else. Um, how do you respond to all that we are seeing right now? And what do you think is the right way that India should respond? Well, Maldives is, uh, you know, uh, perhaps might be seen as a small country, but has a big significance for India. Uh, you know, that's the baseline. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's a very complex uh, country. You have democracy on one side that came in 2008, almost on plateau, though Nasheed had to fight for it. And then you have a country that basically prides itself in being Islamic also at the same time. So what has happened is actually these two uh, have somewhat polarized democratic forces and uh, I would say those who support conservatism. 
I won't call them Islamic forces necessarily, but the conservative forces that uh, tilt uh, towards uh, Islam and you know uh, it, its tenets. Now these do not always go together. See if you take even President Mamun's Mamun Gayum's uh, you know time seventy eight to two thousand eight, uh, you realize that he was also a very conservative man. Uh, he ran a you know centrally controlled uh, system. But he was able to balance, you know, uh, India with other countries by giving India first, uh, you know, preference because he understood, uh, and he was a wise man. He understood that without India, it's going to be very difficult to run the country. This time, uh, the difference is that uh, uh, the new leader, President Moizu, besides being conservative, he has taken a kind of a slightly open, uh, you know, uh, stance, which is clearly pro-China. The fact that he's gone to China right now, there are these 20 deals that have been announced or whatever it is, telling Chinese tourists to come and fill up the space. Is he pushing this a lot further than any of the... Uh, I mean, yeah, it's not that Yamin yeah, I mean, was particularly pro-India either. You know, we've, we've had this up, up and down. But is he pushing the boundary further? And what do you think India's response should be to that? See, I, 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 you, you mentioned rightly with President Yamin's time, which was, again not so uh, good for India in terms of uh, relations with Maldives. But the difference was Yamin was primarily motivated by commercial interests. Uh, you know, politics just come to him on the way. And he utilized it for his ultimate uh, commercial ends. And that's why his friendship with China, which protected him. However, Muizu seems to be more on the conservative track. Uh, you know, uh, so I think this is a prime uh, difference. I have not really heard much about Moises' e economic or uh, commercial. So we have to uh, we have to really work hard, uh, you know, through diplomatic channels uh, to impress upon him. And you know, it's very unfortunate and unforgivable that three junior ministers speak something uh, which is absolutely un uh, unparliamentary and to some extent, I would say, uh, not. Uh, in, in consonance with the dignity of their office. So, we, we saw strong reactions from the opposition, right? Mr. Nasheed and other people who are friends of India, they came out and they condemned that. Those ministers were suspended. How do you see this proceeding? I mean, is there a chance? Should India be working closely with the opposition now? Or is there no alternative but to reach out to Muizu at some point and say, look, what are you doing? At the end of the day, you can't manage without us. And, you know, India also needs the Maldives because of sea lanes and the rest of it. We don't want it to become a Chinese uh, you know, satellite uh, like Pakistan. My, my, my hunch is as uh, the presidency sinks in in his head and you know he understands more and more about India's role in Maldives, India's relations with Maldives, the depth, the spread. Uh, you know, it's not limited to strategic alone. Uh, it's people to people relations. It's about health. It's about education. It's about tourism. Uh, so, you know, economy is uh, majorly right now dependent on India too. But also, you know, who will go to the uh, 200 inhabited islands? Which doctors will go if they are from India? Which, which country will send its teachers to the distant faraway islands? It has to be India. So uh, no one else has taken that place in the last, uh, say, 40 years or so. Uh, and yeah. so India has, a, apart from having a strong strategic relationship with Maldives, primarily because Indo-Pacific and India's own, uh, you know, role, uh, both real, real and perceived, and what uh, aspirations we have about our own position in the world, it's very important that uh, we do have Maldives on our side. Though we may not agree on every single point, uh, that's you know, right. diplomatic freedom, and you can call it sovereign. Uh, choices. Uh, but Maldives has to be very careful in exercising both choices. That's where I, how I see it. Right. Man, man uh, thank you. So let me let me turn that, uh, throw that question across to you. Bangladesh, another country where some of those conservative forces are there. They are anti-India forces in Bangladesh. But luckily, Sheikh Hasina has been there for a while. And of course, there are a lot of questions in the West and others how free and fair were the elections, the opposition boycotted it. But India must be very relieved that uh, Sheikh Hasina is going to stay on and there's therefore continuity. 
Yes, I think um, uh, certainly we are very pleased to see uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina back as Prime Minister for her fourth consecutive term. And I think that uh, the reason is the element, as you yourself mentioned, of continuity and stability. Because uh, it was very clear all along that uh, the opposition, uh, the BNP, for example, I mean, refusing to participate in the elections on the grounds that you want a caretaker government, which has been turned away by a constitutional amendment passed in Parliament, it was a non starter, you know, and uh, on, on those grounds to claim that the elections are not going to be free and fair, uh, this was really <clears throat> not uh, going to happen. I think one of the most important things, both in Bangladesh and in Maldives, is about the reaction of the people. And I think here, uh, there was a kind of a expectation by the BNP or the Jamaat saying, okay, we'll see what happens in the elections, but afterwards the people are going to rise up in what they call a movement, you know. Uh, that has not happened. The people have accepted the results. Everything is calm. Everything is peaceful. And even the BNP in a press conference uh, held yesterday or day before said, yes, now all we can do is wait for another five years. So I think this acceptance by the people is an important point. And my point, I would refer briefly to the Maldives because... Uh, I have a South Asia Women's Network, which encompasses uh, nine countries I've been running yeah. for 15 years. And I must say that the people of Maldives, my members and others, they have come up very strongly against what those three deputy ministers have said, uh, such derogatory remarks about India. And they have said, we don't accept it. The Tourism Association of Maldives, which is a very powerful association, has come up strongly advising their president to say, look, we want to change this and we want good relations with India. It's essential for our tourist industry. So this kind of a positive response is what India should work for in the neighborhood. This is very important. All right, ma'am. So Bangladesh, you're saying all is under control right now. Don't worry about it. Figure out the rest. Well, I is think that, that some... No, I, I think that uh, we have to go ahead with our programs that, you know, there's a very good rapport between Prime Minister Modi and Prime <laughs> Minister A number of important initiatives have been uh, taken up. Some have been completed. Some are in the process of completion. But I think the effort to bring in the people in a more active dialogue, whether it is academicians or students or uh, young professionals, okay. The people who talk about it and get influenced, maybe by on the religion factor, maybe on other factors. But unless you uh, bring them into the dialogue, uh, you know, explain to them. And that this, uh, this factor of religion, uh, just as in Maldives, is very important in Bangladesh as well. Radicalization right. is going up. One has to look at it very carefully. And uh, we have to work on it with the government and with the people. Right, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Mr. last very quick word from you. Are you, are you pleased to see the reaction from the people of the Maldives, tourist associations, the opposition and others? So perhaps Moizu also needs to realize that he needs to tone it down a bit. Yeah, I think it was expected that, uh, you know, people who know, people who work closely with India. Uh, and, you know, Moizu is also not, un, you know, unfamiliar or strange uh, to uh, India and its role in Maldives. So hopefully things will change and our diplomacy is currently in full swing. Uh, their ambassador, High Commissioner, was called by MEA here. I understand our ambassador, High Commissioner, was also uh, you know, summoned there. So a lot of things right. must be going on right now, which you and me are perhaps not aware. But I do see, uh, that, right. things, I, I do see that things would improve uh, you know, in the coming uh, months and weeks. Uh, and this chapter will be behind us. All right. Hi, Commissioner Mulia. Hi, Commissioner Sikri. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Vikram. Thanks.